tell us a little bit about um, how you came to be so fascinated by that early acquisition of language and its effect on the brain. So I, I love this work, and I think that it's so um, incredibly dependent on this interaction of disciplines. So neuroscientists would not be able to peer into the baby brain the way we now can without the development of the technologies that allow us with an MEG machine, magnetoencephalography, you know, 23 letter word that you don't want to try to spell. And then you need an army of physicists and engineers to run it because the sophisticated software you need to track the baby's head. We want the baby to be freely moving. It's a quiet machine. We want that child to be able to act and react and, and sort of not only listen, but look and sometimes solve problems. So we want that baby moving around in the machine. And of course, we need to know where the structures are in the brain at all times. So we're tracking that head with four pellets and a very sophisticated way of understanding the size and shape of that baby's brain. We're doing some brand new studies on face-to-face face neuroscience where the baby's in the Meg machine and mom or dad has an ERP cap on, you know, the cap with the sensors. Mm -hmm. And these two are co-registered, and we're watching the action and interaction between two brains are, who are both mutually influencing each other. So by co-registered means afterwards you can sync up the signals, so you're looking at yeah. what's going on in the parent's brain while they're talking to their child. Yes, exactly. And what's going on in the child's brain. Yes, and we have a mom or dad under two conditions, one in which they're uh, interacting positively and talking and exactly the way you think face-to-face -face would go, and then the other in which she's instructed to just abruptly turn away and do this, right? What is she doing? She's distracted on, on her, her phone. cell phone. And she refuses to respond to the baby's bids for attention. And to see the firestorm that goes on in the baby brain under those circumstances is really wild and interesting. And to see the engagement and the kind of neural synchrony that results when the two are in a kind of emotional social synchrony. And that's what we're calling the kind of gateway to learning, that this open, wide open social brain um, is, is one in which the information coming from the environment is rapidly and efficiently mapped by the brain and quite, I'd call almost indelible in its um, ability to stay with the brain. So these early, the early language you learn, the early cultural habits and practices, the early values, the early ways in which you situate yourself in the world. These are the kinds of interactions that come through a, a social emotional relationship. And it has very, it has sticking power in the brain. Those habits and values and language and cultural aspects, the kinds of things that you learn implicitly just by being in a setting, that's the indel indelible stuff of yeah, childhood. Yeah, that's fascinating. As you talk about bids for learning and being in a social setting, you're starting to answer something that was puzzling for me, or at least I was wondering about what could be the mechanisms. You presented some incredible data that uh, children who are exposed to just very short immersion in a yes. totally different language to their parents, I think it was Chinese for American babies, right. um, then ha retained that ability to distinguish those sounds years later. Exactly. But if they just watched someone on a video, even though they looked outwardly like they were engaging with the video screen, right. that learning effect didn't take place. Exactly. And I was wondering, what's the difference? Well, so the difference looks like when you look at the brains in interaction socially and then in a you know TV setting, what happens is that the TV setting is interesting to babies. They crawl up to it, some of them touch it. It's got visual stuff going on and they seem like they're entranced. But in a social situation, they're not like just entrained, they're engaged. They're, you can see babies wanting to react. And when we look inside the brain, we can see that when you're talking and interacting with the baby, the motor centers that will eventually allow them to talk and socially react to you, are already working. It's like when you talk to a baby, you rehearse those motor centers that are going to be essential for the baby to talk back and join the conversation. TVs don't do that. They don't engage that social brain. So when we're in a kind of back and forth social situation, you expect to be taking something in, but you're just as eager to give something back.
And it's that back and forth, that sort of serve and volley that seems to get the human brain uh, really, really going. And eventually we'll understand this as a, a set of, of, of biochemical reactions that are engaged when we're in this kind of face-to-face um, -face That's setting. interesting. Do you think that's related? I've read and it's also been my personal experience when I'm trying to study something and memorize it, far more effective than reviewing the material is to test myself on the material. Absolutely. Is that also related to that back and forth? I think so. I think taking action. So there have been studies done on note taking. So a lot of us sit in class. I used to sit in class, your yellow pad, take your notes, and then sometimes not even go back and read those notes. The mere activity of having to receive information and then put it in your own words, react in a motor way. We are kind of sensory motor creatures. We're not just, you know, vessels receiving information, but our whole, the whole point of life is to act back, to do something to affect the world. And I think babies want that right from the beginning. They want to do what you do, act as you act. You are, they see you as like them, like me, and they want to replicate that. You know, the comparison is, is unfortunately kids who are um, neglected. So we are engaging in some studies with five-year-olds who in the first two years of life were neglected. And we match them to controls at five who have never been in foster care and you didn't experience that neglect. And even after three years of being out of those foster care fam, you know, in foster care, so they're out of those neglectful families, their brains are still totally different. It's the as though that early, you know, that early neglect just allowed a whole period of time to pass that you can't that you can't gain back. It's a magical time. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating because um, you're hinting on an, another piece of work that you're also very well known for, which is this ability to uh, pick up languages uh, declines rapidly right after age seven right. as it starts to be a rapid decline. What were the influence, the cross-disciplinary influences on you at that time that caused you to, to go into that direction? I've always been curious about, about human learning and particularly uh, kids' abilities to learn and adults who work very hard at learning who are unable to. Um, I came from a field in which their uh, speech and language pathology, I thought in the beginning I was going to be a, a neuroscientist who worked in a, in a hospital with patients who, were, who had brain damage and then eventually decided that rather than look at the damaged brain, I'd look at the, the brain at the beginning of life and look at how complex information is mapped. And so this idea that age made, makes a huge difference. I had started to work in hospital settings with kids who had been in car accidents or who had gunshot wounds, unfortunately, and who's, who had brain damage on either the right or the left side. And I recognized that in these young children, recovery was possible under the age of five. So I remember a little girl who was hit by a car at age three. And she was in the hospital for quite a long time and she'd lost all of her words, all of her sentences and phrases, ability to talk, and she was paralyzed on the right side, which meant that she had left hemisphere damage. And so I worked with her over a two year period in which she had full recovery of language and watched as she started from the beginning and, and used her, we assume, we didn't have brain imaging at the time, used her right hemisphere to recover that function. Now in an adult who's had a stroke, no such thing happens. There isn't that opportunity to recover from uh, brain damage. And so it was that initial exposure in a clinical setting, clinical research setting that the made clue me- you in that something might happen important at age seven. Something is going on that's different in brains that has to do with age and the changes that occur with age that enable learning early and, and put the brakes on learning later. Interesting. Uh, another thing that you showed today that I found fascinating was how music, yes. interactive music, can yes. also have a powerful effect on the ability to learn language. Right. Yeah, what, it's amazing, what, isn't it? What's the it? connection there? I mean, well, so it, it, I had a concert pianist as a postdoc. Uh, 
She came into the lab and she says, I'd love to know what music does to the brain. And I'm convinced that it really, there's a sort of opening feature. There's something that, that opens your mind to other uh, learning when you're a musician. I said, it's an interesting hypothesis. I've not studied music, but I love music. And so we started to think about studies, exposing babies to music, just as I had been exposing them to Mandarin or Spanish, at that same kind of magical window between six and 12 months in the first year of life. And so we used rhythm because rhythm is, you know, a component of music that sort of sets the brain with an expectancy. Rhythm has a predictable rhythm. And the idea was that what babies have to do in life, what we all have to do is detect the patterns in the world around us, predict how they're supposed to flow out in time. And if something's awry, notice it. So when she exposed babies to the walls for 12 sessions, again, they only get five hours of experience. Her prediction was we're going to change their sensory systems to allow them to detect uh, off-timed rhythms. So if you miss a beat, that baby in the experimental group is really going to react. But the su two surprises happened. She, her prediction was true. But the first surprise was it's not only auditory cortex that's affected, it's prefrontal cortex, which is a very general pattern and attention directing part of the brain. And she, what she noticed is that in the kids who had had the music, as soon as the uh, stimulus started, the prefrontal cortex was very much more active than in, in the control group. And when she tested them with speech, with rhythmic changes in speech, the experimental group was much better than the control group. So her conclusion was that music prepares the brain to detect patterns, expect patterns, and react when patterns that you expected are not delivered appropriately.